<coughs> now at this point we've been playing a bit with CSS and this is a big ball of wax, a big ball of yarn to work with because we saw here just a little freestyling trying to figure that out, how, how does that actually work and that's what I, I came across. And that comes across uh, with, uh, with, I think, the best ways to do this element in Spectre. Now, honestly, I haven't looked through every single screen of jQuery Mobile. Maybe there's a screen in jQuery Mobile that tells you exactly what to edit whenever you want to edit something. But there's only so many hours in the day, and I haven't found it yet. So if you find it, let us know. There might be a screen somewhere in jQuery Mobile. Type this to change that. Type this to change that. So we're, we're doing it here the hard way, because sometimes we don't have you know, a frequently asked questions page to help us. So let's explore a little bit more what I mean about this sleuthing, this detective work, because it does really feel like it at times. I'm going to open my project again in, in Firefox, and um, I've got my project here. It looks pretty nice, but I'm kind of not liking empty space here too much. Maybe here. I'd like to tighten that up. I can, of course. I can do anything with CSS. How easy is it going to be? That's always the tricky thing. So here's how I would do this to, to figure this out on my own app. I would use the element inspector again. You really need to get used to calling <coughs> that up. It's basically F12. F12 brings up the debugger, the console, and the element inspector. Uh, so I've opened up my project. I want to figure out how to empty, how to close up that space above <coughs> welcome. You can do right-click, inspect element, or you can do F12, and it'll remember the last screen you were on. If you were using console <coughs> or round over, when you do F12, that's what'll come up last. If you're on inspector, then it'll open up the inspector every time you F12. And so, let's say however you open it, you want to figure out that space there. I'm going to click the, the pick the element item. This is usually the best way to go. Select that so it's highlighted, and then you hover over that element. And sometimes it's pretty obvious you ho you hover over something, and what pops up it says H2 right there. Or sometimes it's more complex where you've got this element inside of another element, so I kind of have to move my mouse around. Maybe I need to hover over, you know, this other thing over here or this other thing here, right there. So I have to kind of move around a little bit to highlight that element, the, the larger element of the footer. Notice that pops up also to tell you you're kind of hovering over this thing. Footer. The tag footer. And it doesn't display it with the angle brackets. Because the dots are <coughs> classes, the hash marks are IDs, and when there's nothing there, it's usually a tag. So the footer tag has a class attached to it. That's what that little pop-up is telling me. That's the dot. You know, if I'm hovering over this element, there's an H4 tag here with a class of UI-title attached to it. That's what we discovered earlier. I'm hovering over Welcome, and it's saying it's a plain old H2. Well, that's good. I'm going to click on it so that it actually highlights it in the code on the HTML code at the left and the CSS code on the right. And what I'm going to do is, now I'm going to scroll up and down this a little bit to look for any hints. Let's say I'm trying to change the color of this. I would then scroll around here to find anything that it says color. That's color, and it could be possibly UI overlay A, UI page theme A, UI page theme A panel. It could possibly be those, but most likely it's the one that's highlighted. Because we've got this, comma, this, comma, that, etc. So all of these CSS attributes are being applied to all of these three things at once. There's your commas. But the one it specifically means is this one that is highlighted. So the same thing over here. This stuff, which is overridden later on, is trying to apply to all of these, but at the moment it's applying to this element here, page theme A, because that's what I've clicked on. What I'm saying is, I'm just going to browse around, see if I can find the thing that I think I want to find. So in this case, color is there, and notice if I click on that color, it gives me a bunch of colors. Oh, it's red. So that's helping me figure out that if I write some CSS code, 
.ui-page-dma, it'll change that text color, text color. That's not what I'm going for. I'm going for the spacing. Let me refresh that to reset it. To take it back, you, I usually just refresh the screen. I'm looking for something about maybe sizes. What are the possibilities that we've talked about previously about, you know, sizes and such? Line height, good. Anything else? Margins. Margins, good. Padding, maybe. So we have a few things, maybe even font size. We have a few things regarding size that might help us here. And that's why I'm going to browse around here. Do I see anything about padding? Do I see anything about margin? There's a line height, 1.3. The cool thing is that we can make changes here. This is real CSS. And we can make changes to the CSS, and it'll apply it live. It doesn't apply it for real or permanently in any of my CSS files. This is a playground. This is a scratch pad, sandbox. To make changes here without affecting my real code, to maybe figure out what's going on. So I'm just going to try this. This is line height 1.3. It didn't really say a units. But anyway, I'll try 1.2. So something is getting bigger. What about a 0 0.3? It's getting smaller, but it only cleaned up the space between the welcome and the picture. I want the space above welcome to be shortened up a little bit. Maybe that's not quite right, so I'm going to reset that. Okay, well, maybe that's not quite it. But I'm not done with detective work. I don't see anything here, possibly margins and spaces and such, even height. But remember, this is an element inside of another <coughs> one, inside of another one, inside of another one. So what if I back up one level? What if I click to the level right above it? Oh, you see padding. Article, padding. Maybe that's it. What if I change that? 1M, okay. Usually I, I make a big number or a small number just to make sure something's happening. <coughs> Put, I don't know, 5M. Hmm. I made a big space there. 1M. I can do fractions here, so 0.25M. That is bringing it up, but what is it also doing besides bringing it up? It's bringing the footer up too. Yes, but specifically here, it's also bringing it to the left. You can't see it here, but it's also moving it to the left. As I increase these values, it pushes it up, it pushes it over to the right and down. And notice I'm just pressing up and down at this point on the keyboard. Once I select an element, I can press up and down to add more units. So that was on 1M. Padding is being applied. Remember we talked about the box model. What does the box model in CSS mean? All four sides. Top, right, bottom, left. Four sides. There's something on all four sides of an element. There's an invisible box around it. We talked about the shorthand of putting one value here applies it to all four sides of the box. What if I do 1EM, space 2EM, space 3EM, space 4EM? One unit of space at the top, two on the right, three on the bottom, four on the left, clockwise. Top, right, bottom, left. At the top I've got one, on the right I've got two, but there's nothing really there. On the bottom I've got three, and on the left I've got four. Each one of these I can change independently. That one actually doesn't seem too, to do too much at the bottom. On the left, that definitely moves it to the left. Hmm. You want to contain the input picture, maybe? It could. That's why I might further explore what I'm looking for. And what if I put smaller numbers here? Um, I don't believe we can do negative one, negative numbers, not really. So this is what I'm saying about the complexity of this. I have to see in my element inspector here, is it this possibly 
wait a minute, this is inside of that, so maybe we have to go back one level further. Section. I'm going to reset this. Now back up to section. Padding top 127. Padding bottom 52. Minimum height 128. Well, I'll just change these values. I think I got it. But it wasn't as obvious as, let me edit that element. No, I'm editing the parent of that element, actually the parent of the parent of that element, the whole section. So maybe now in retrospect it might make sense. Give a certain amount of space to every section of my of my app. The default was 127. What if I put, uh, I don't know, 75? It's too small. But, um, 94. 100. So, I'm figuring out perhaps 100 pixels at the top of that uh, element. It seems to be section. Um, this is also I can try a couple of ways here this one is saying here's some inline CSS padding top Okay, so I'm going to try this. I'm going to reset it. I'm going to go back to my code, my CSS code. And then I'm going to add section, simply section, no pound sign or anything because it's a tag. Um, padding dash top 100 px so I added that and then I refreshed it and it didn't didn't quite affect it so it's going to be more a little more complex than that be section pound home, but then that will only apply to the home, UI page. So, do you guys ever see those um, those movies where the computer wizard taps a little like that and they get it all fixed? Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen. In, that doesn't happen in real life. <laughs> There's no way. So, this is gonna take a little longer than than I really, really want to spend time on. But that's what I would be doing. 
Um, I would be going through this inspector, checking, uh, trying to figure out how this is designed. And again, there might be a very simple solution over at jQueryMobile.com that tells you exactly how to change that sorts of padding and such. And I'm on track here where, I'm, where it's saying, you know, it is padding top, but this is an inline quick fix here. There, there has to be something that we can edit here, most likely very detailed, because it is saying in this section you've got these classes. It might be that. So I don't want to spend style too much time. What's that? You can see the style in it now. Where? Yeah, when they style you. The last line, yeah. yeah, it's style equals, but that's inline, which is dynamic. That's being added at the yeah. moment that we're rendering, so we can't really deal with it. Um, I'm going to try here to take this whole class. Maybe I need to be that specific. The top and the bottom? It sort of seems it's just the top because there's something that says padding top of 127 and that's pretty big. And then the bottom, it's enough. It, to me it seems it's enough at the bottom. I might want to tighten it up even more and I have to figure out where that bottom is. So I might have to do both, but for the moment I'm just concentrating on top. How did you make it do that? How did you make it go up one by one to see what you're scoring? How do I get the number? What you do is once you figure out what you're trying to change and you highlight the, the value yes. that you're trying to change, all you then need to do is use the keyboard up and down, and then that adds more values. If you hold shift, it goes faster. Does that do the chrome message? Yeah. The question is how do you get it to zoom in and out so quick? This zoom right here? That's on, on Windows. You have a variation on the Mac, but on Windows you hold down the Windows key and press plus, the plus symbol in the in the keyboard. Okay. I mean on the keypad on the right, that zooms you in. Let me try one more thing, and if it doesn't quite work, I'm gonna move on. But I'm trying to see, well, it might be these classes. And all of these are dots. All of these classes inside of a section. Nope. So. I feel better seeing this is how you do it because this is how I struggle and I just thought it must be a bad way. Anyway. No, this is basically the way uh, everyone does this. The element inspector on Google Chrome and, and Firefox and all of them, it's, it's worshipped in the world of web design because this is what pulls back the curtain for everything and it helps us you know figure it out with the sandbox and uh, the classic way was firebug so firebug back in the day when it was you had to get a separate little plugin to do this in firefox now they've all got it built in i don't even touch firebug anymore I just use the built-in one because they're all really good they've all got them now internet explorer safari chrome firefox opera they've all got one of these versions of an element <coughs> inspector and this is how i do it in the real world and I know I've done this for my own apps. I don't remember because, you know, I've, I've learned so much. I've forgotten so much, too. Um, if I look at my own app, I'm sure I, I have the code there. But that's how I would do it anyway. I would try to reverse engineer it like this and then um, figure it out eventually. Uh, maybe also go over to Stack Overflow and ask a question there. I'm sure someone's already asked this question. How do I change my, H, my H2 in the, in the section? Yeah, other tabs. So they have to debug the style and they don't want that to be too. What do they mean? Other than Inspector, there's Mac, Mac, Console, and then Debugger. Oh, these right here, yes. Console, we spent the time in Console. Debugger, in, uh, debugger is for you to check your JavaScript. You can set breakpoints, break uh, you know, set a breakpoint break here so that you can check if the code works. It basically pauses your code at a certain point. How do you put a breakpoint in? You just click here. You just click on the left column here. So I want to say style, style, and, and, and 
This one. Uh, I don't spend too much time on this one, so I'm not exactly sure on this one. Uh, I guess I can. We can edit stuff directly here in CSS. Performance and network. I, I don't use performance much, but network is useful to to see how fast your app downloads. If it's still a website, so Google downloaded in 1.59 seconds. Being downloaded in 0 0.2 point, 3 point, 5 point seconds. So it doesn't quite <coughs> is isn't quite useful for us for our apps for the network because we're not on we're not going to ultimately have this on the network. But just a bunch of uh, developer tools. Uh, they're all built into the various browsers, and the important one for us at the moment is the. Inspector, because it'll help us, you know, dissect, <coughs> dissect the um, the design. Um, I did say that I wanted to talk about unique icons. We're kind of running out of time, but let me start us in that direction. We, we won't get too far with it, but I, I want to say, well, what if we want our own unique icons? You know, what if we want our something that I designed, something that I drew. <coughs> let's go see how we would do this. Go to your web browser and let's go to jQueryMobile.com. jQueryMobile.com. We'll go to the demos. Latest stable demos. And then go to the icons section in the CSS framework. So here it's a list of all of our icons. We've seen that. If you go all the way down, you're going to see a section about where did they put it. Oh, here we go. Custom icons. Icons are displayed as background image <coughs> of the after pseudo element. Target the pseudo element to set a custom icon. Okay, so here's a little skull icon. You can safely use SVG icons. The framework contains SVG support test and adds classes, etc. Use this class in your CSS to provide a ping fallback. So basically, it's saying here how to do it, uh, displaying your images as SVG or PNG. And the thing about SVGs is that not every software can create them. Pings, every software can create them. Microsoft Paint can create pings. SVGs are a little better in that they are scalable. That's what it stands for, scalable vector graphics. These are graphics that look good big and small and in between. Well, that sounds good. I want to have very high quality graphics of mine. I want to make SVGs. Photoshop does not make SVGs to my knowledge unless the most latest versions do. I don't have the latest, latest version. Uh, Illustrator, I believe, does make SVGs, but if you don't know Illustrator, you're going to be lost. And um, basically, how to make an SVG, <laughs> online SVG image converter, convert image to SVG format, convert browse, so I just did a quick search here, how to make an SVG, and the first result is a converter. I've never seen it before. I don't know how good quality it is. You guys could check it out and tell me about it. Uh, so Illustrator can help you make SVGs. Um, a companion, or not a companion, a competitor uh, to Illustrator is a software called Inkscape. Inkscape.org, it's open source. It's like Illustrator, it's Mac, Linux, Windows, um, it's free. It's like Illustrator. You can make SVG graphics there. Again, but if you don't know, if you don't quite know Illustrator, you might not have a lot to work with here. Think of YMCP. Yeah, you can <coughs> learn everything here. Uh, and so here's a free software, Inkscape.com, and you can create your own unique graphics here too. Do you know a good one? Um, that's free, like, 
other than like GIMP? Yep, besides GIMP, there's also a very useful one. It's not as powerful as GIMP and um, Photoshop, but there's Pixlr. Okay, yeah, I found that one too. This is, this is like a baby Photoshop. Pixlr.com, it's free. Pixlr Editor, the web app. You just launch it, and on any web browser, I suppose that runs Flash, uh, you can uh, use Pixlr and do some quick <coughs> photo editing and photo creation. There we go. So we've got even all the keyboard shortcuts. Oh, cool. It's, it's not set up like Photoshop. I didn't open it up there. Just download. You can do the web version. You can do the download version. There's an app also. So pixlr.com. It's like a free baby version of Photoshop. So let's say, okay, I, I kind of know Photoshop. Um, I don't know Illustrator, so I can't make SVGs, but I, I can make plain old <coughs> pings. That's the fallback. If I want to make my own custom icons, that's what the documentation is telling me. And then I can actually view source here. So in my HTML, this is what I need to write. And in my CSS, this is what I need to write. Basically, dot UI dash icon dash my icon. I'm inventing my own icon. I can call it whatever I want. <coughs> UI dash icon dash baby. And I draw a little baby face. And then the code is further here at uh, colon after background image pointed to my graphic. Set the size of my graphic to 18 pixels. So I have to write a little, it's three parts. I design my graphic and put it into my project. I write some CSS. The CSS accesses the graphic right there, skull. And part three, step three, is in the HTML. I, I write here basically uh, ui-icon-myicon, whatever I called it. If I called it baby, I write ui-icon baby face. Because in my code here, I wrote the CSS code UI dash icon baby face. And so we can't quite do it at the moment because we would need the graphic, first of all. But the code, it's a little copy and paste here. Notice this is also a little different in that it's got button, class, equals, etc., etc. If you look at the documentation, you see that another way, th this, this class, etc., is synonymous with data-button, or uh, data-role equals button, and data-icon equals uh, babyface. This shorthand is synonymous with the longhand of UI-button, make it a button. UI-shadow, give it a drop shadow. UI-corner-all, make all the corners rounded. UI-button-icon-left, put the icon on the left. And finally, which icon? My icon, <laughs> baby face. All of that is the same as simply data roll button, data icon, my icon. Sometimes you need to do it the long way here, I've found. Sometimes you do need to do the class way rather than the data role, like when we get over to more <coughs> complexity with JavaScript of dynamically loading content. So you heard the expression, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. So I'm leading you guys to the water. If you guys want to make your own icons, check that out there. We might have time next time, but definitely next time what I want to talk about is JSON. That'll take us all day. JSON, JavaScript object notation. That'll be talking about these this, this basic standard nowadays, everything is in JSON format. It's a way to transmit and store data. Um, Twitter uses it, Flickr uses it, the Internet Movie Database uses it. All of these websites with a big data base full of information <coughs> uses JSON. And we can create an app that taps into the Internet Movie Database's database, and our app can pull in information about any movie in the world for free. But it's going to give it to us in this format, JSON. And if you've never used it before, 
It's going to look alien, but it's going to look familiar to a point because it's JavaScript based. And when we pull that data out of these databases, you know, we can create a Twitter app. Twitter will give us all of the data we want in JSON format, and then we can load it up on our app. That's what we're going to spend Thursday on, the last day of class, to talk about JSON. And then we'll do part three of the class after spring break, and then we'll get to the database. Question? PouchDB. We're going to use PouchDB, which is a NoSQL database, which is basically JSON format. Format. <coughs> JSON formatted. I think we've got a website we can look at, maybe json.org. Yeah, here it is. You can go over to json.org and start to prep a little bit for it, but it's very, very wordy and technical. And we'll do it together. Question? I just, I, you know, the complexity of the CSS, and it's nice to have a, a program like Cordova or Jacob or Jacob create all this intense code for you, but why not just write something simple, right from scratch? Definitely, that's another possibility. You can get, you know, bootstrap and start from scratch and make your own columns and headers and all of that, but that's what the point of jQuery Mobile is. The jQuery Mobile created this structure for us to quickly create a mobile-friendly project. It's not the only one. There's also um, Ionic and Angular and all of these ones that help us create something, you know, modern. We could do a version of this from scratch but you have to deal with writing all of the code to center that and to make these columns perfectly proportional and all of that. That's what this jumpstart is, any of these frameworks to get us started. And the drawback is that someone did a lot of the hard work and we have to then do some reverse engineering to get it to work exactly how we want. But I think the trade-off is, look at what we, we built this when we did it in class. We did it in one day. We, were, we had started with a 10-line HTML file. We added jQuery mobile and added data roll page, and we've got a brand new page of design. And we reverse engineer it a bit, and sometimes it's easier than other times. And you saw myself. I would have loved to have answered that issue there. I'll figure it out eventually. But um, the trade-offs, I think, are, are, are not so bad. So that's what we're going to look at next time. I'll put my code in the network, network folder. Remember, uh, check out the videos. Everything that we've done is online. If you haven't uh, requested those videos, send me an email, and I'll send you a link to all the videos. Any final general questions? What will you cover from Android 3? Say that again? What will you cover uh, from Android 3 classes? Yeah, it's simply called uh, an Android App Development in HTML Part 3. There is a Roman numeral 3 in the class, in the catalog. But, you know, same bat time, same bat channel. Just come back in two weeks, and it'll, it'll be here. Same Batman, yes. <laughs> so, that's it for the moment. Um, make sure to sign in if you came a little bit late. Don't forget your beverages. I'll put my stuff in the network folder, and then have a little lap time. So, we'll do it again next time.